Hey guys, welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be Emergency Medicine Board Exam High Yield Facts Part 2. Hopefully you've had a chance to watch Part 1. If you did, thank you so much for that. This is going to be the second video in the series. Same disclaimers as before, this information is supposed to be high yield for the in-training exam that residents are going to be taking early next year, but it is also high yield for the ABAM qualifying exam that you take after graduating from residency. Some of the information in this video may vary depending on when you're watching it or depending on what study resource you're using. If if you are finding different information in the resources you are using, I would recommend going ahead and using that so that you are being consistent with your studying. All that being said, let's go ahead and jump right into it. First one here, what is the most common cause of croup? This is something that we see in children all the time, and for the boards, we need to know the microbe that is causing it. In this case, the most common cause of croup is para-influenza virus. What is the first step of management in a pregnant patient with late decelerations on tocodynamometry? Really simple, before we do anything else, we want to turn the patient in the left lateral decubitus position to relieve pressure from the IVC. Pregnant patients, especially later on in their third trimester, babies growing, the uterus is coming up just below the subxiphoid process that is going to start putting a lot of pressure on the IVC, especially when the patient is supine. We're going to want to turn the patient left lateral decubitus, get some of that pressure off of the IVC, get some of that blood going back to the heart, and that may fix a lot of the problems that we're having. What is the most common cause of Lemierre syndrome? Unfortunately, this is something that we're not really seeing very much in the department, but we really just need to memorize it for boards. So the most common cause of Lemierre syndrome is going to be Fusobacterium necrophorum. What is the most common cause of infectious erythema nodosum? This one's important to know. It's going to be strep pharyngitis. The most common cause of infectious erythema nodosum is strep pharyngitis, and that usually occurs about one to three weeks after the onset of sore throat. So patients may have had their course of strep pharyngitis and are clearing that up, and then one to three weeks later, they may start having erythema nodosum. What is the first step in assessing an intubated patient that develops cardiac arrest? This is important for the boards, but also really important for real life. If you have an intubated patient that's decompensating, they're arresting, whatever it is, the first thing that you want to do is disconnect them from the ventilator and begin bag mask ventilation. That way you are ruling out any electronic equipment error, anything like that. That's the really the first important thing that you want to do. Blank is a spirochete infection caused by exposure to water contaminated with urine of infected animals. Again, something we really just need to know primarily for the boards, but this is leptospirosis. If you see anything like that, urine of infected animals and somebody drinks the water that's contaminated with that, we want to be thinking about leptospirosis. Blank is the most sensitive modality for detecting placental abruption. This is something that we absolutely need to know. This is going to be continuous fetal heart rate monitoring. They may ask you this on the exam and there may be other attempting options such as transvaginal or transabdominal ultrasound. Those are not correct. The most sensitive modality for detecting placental abruption is going to be continuous fetal heart rate monitoring. What is the treatment for intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy? This is what is the treatment for intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy? The treatment here is going to be UDCA or urso deoxycholic acid. The other really important thing to note here is if you have patients that have intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, typically if they're greater than 37 weeks gestation, we also do want to deliver because there are some associated risks with that. Blank is the most common opportunistic infection in HIV AIDS. It's going to be PCP pneumonia or PJP pneumonia, whichever one you want to call it. That is the most common opportunistic opportunistic infection in HIV and AIDS. What class of medications is commonly associated with tendon rupture? Hopefully most of us know this one. It's going to be the fluoroquinolones, the ciprofloxacin, the levofloxacin, all of those. They're going to be associated with tendon rupture, particularly the Achilles tendon. That's one of the big reasons that we avoid this medication, especially in our elderly populations. What nerve is frequently damaged with zygoma fractures? This is going to be the infraorbital nerve. So if you have a zygomatic arch fracture or zygoma fracture, there's going to be damage probably to the infraorbital nerve. And how is that going to present? There's going to be paresthesias of the lower eyelid, the upper lip, and the ipsilateral nose. I'm going to say that one more time. If you have damage to the infraorbital nerve, it's going to cause paresthesias of the ipsilateral lower eyelid, the ipsilateral upper lip, and the ipsilateral nose. Really important to know that distribution. What is a common adverse effect of quinine? It's going to be hypoglycemia. Injury to the common peroneal nerve can lead to decreased sensation of which area? They really love these questions on the exam. You injure this nerve, what does that cause in terms of motor or sensory deficits? In the case of the common peroneal nerve, it's going to lead to decreased decreased sensation of the first dorsal web space. You really want to know that association. Up to 30% of cases of polyarteritis nodosa are associated with blank. This one's important to know. It's going to be hepatitis B. 
So if you see polyarteritis nodo so if you see polyarteritis nodosa on the exam, you also want to be thinking about hepatitis B. Next one, why is the use of calcium channel blockers absolutely contraindicated in children less than one year old? This one is super important because it is super dangerous. We are not using calcium channel blockers in children who are less than one year old because it can lead to irreversible hypotension. That is an absolute contraindication. Really important to know that. Wernicke's encephalopathy triad, this is something that we're probably seeing, maybe diagnosing, maybe uh, not diagnosing in the ED, but the triad that we need to know is going to be confusion, altered mental status, whichever one you prefer, ataxia, and ophthalmoplegia. We really want to know that. That is the triad for Wernicke's encephalopathy. Polymicrobial bacteremia may be suggestive of blank. This is going to be Munchausen syndrome. Polymicrobial bacteremia, you know, it can happen in really critically ill patients, but if you have a patient that's bacteremic with multiple different organisms, you want to be thinking about Munchausen syndrome because they may be injecting themselves with harmful substances like fecal material, for example, and that's how they're getting the polymicrobial bacteremia. Another quick side note, Munchausen syndrome, it may also be written as factitious disorder imposed on self on the exam. So make sure you know both of those names. Munchausen syndrome or factitious disorder imposed on self. Presentation of acute tubular necrosis on urinalysis. This is going to be muddy brown casts. This is one that we need to know. We also need to know the picture. So just to jog your visual memory, this is a muddy brown cast here, and that is going to be significant for acute tubular necrosis. Next one, what is the most common site for an aortoenteric fistula to form? This is going to be in the distal duodenum. We really want to know that location. Frequent epistaxis in childhood may be a sign of blank. This is going to be von Willebrand disease. Really keep that in mind. If you have a young female patient, they've had uh, frequent nosebleeds as a child, their, their mother had the same thing. We want to be thinking about von Willebrand disease. What is the hallmark of isopropyl alcohol ingestion? This one is super, super important to know. They love their toxic congestions on the exam. The hallmark of isopropyl alcohol ingestion, you're going to have ketonemia or ketonuria without metabolic acidosis. So you, you are going to have signs of ketones in the blood or in the urine, but you are not going to have a metabolic acidosis associated with that. One really important thing to know in addition to this, on the exam, they may give you a case of a toxic ingestion and they will give you blood work and they will want you to calculate the anion gap. And you will see that the patient has signs of ketones in their blood or in their urine. They may give you a urinalysis as well, but they do not have an elevated anion gap. And if you are seeing that on the exam, you want to be thinking about an isopropyl alcohol ingestion. What is the initial management of an open book pelvic fracture? Most of us probably know this one. We're going to be placing a pelvic binder, but the really important thing that you want to know is where you are placing it. So we are placing a pelvic binder at the level of the greater trochanters. Make sure you know that location. It's not the hips. It's not the lesser trochanters. It's not the ASIS. It is the greater trochanters. What is Prenn's sign? This is just one of those eponyms that we kind of need to know for the exam, but it's elevation of the scrotum leads to pain relief. And this is something that is seen with epididymitis. Acute pancreatitis is most associated with which class of HIV medications? This is going to be nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So if you have a patient that has HIV, they are on these NRTIs. The random association that you need to make is that they are at an increased risk of acute pancreatitis because of that. What is the typical volume of fluid deficit in patients with hyperosmolar coma? The volume deficit is huge. It's up to 8 to 12 liters. So know that if you have a patient with hyperosmolar coma, they are going to need a lot of fluid repletion. What is the most common site of aneurysms in the brain? This is going to be the anterior communicating artery. And just in case you need a pictorial representation as well, this is the circle of Willis that we all probably memorized in med school and kind of forgot about. But right up here, in between the anterior cerebral arteries, we have the anterior communicating artery. And that is the most common site of aneurysms in the brain. What is the most frequent ultrasound finding in ovarian torsion? We probably know this one as well, but do not fall for the trap. Read this one slowly. The most frequent ultrasound finding in ovarian torsion is decreased or absent venous flow with intact arterial flow. So you may have intact arterial flow, but you will see decreased and absent venous flow, and you should still be concerned for ovarian torsion. Really make sure that you have that little detail understood so that you're not getting any silly questions wrong on the exam. Blank may present with cannonball lesions on chest x-ray. This could represent a couple different things, but the big association that I want you guys to make, especially in your male patients, is going to be testicular cancer with pulmonary metastasis. If they show you a chest x-ray and it looks like there's kind of all these cannonball lesions, these splotches all over the place, 
And if it's a male patient, you want to be thinking about testicular cancer, and those are pulmonary meds. Getting to the end here, how do you calculate endotracheal tube size in children? This is a question that's easy to get right if you know the formula, easy to get wrong if you don't. Unfortunately, we can't pull up PD stat on the exam, but calculating endotracheal tube size in children, we're going to do age divided by four plus four. So for example, if we have a four-year-old patient, four divided by four plus four, it's going to be a size five. The really important caveat to know here is that this is for an uncuffed tube, which we really don't use very much in emergency medicine anymore. If you are looking for the size for a cuffed tube, instead of adding four, you are going to add 3.5 is the number that I typically see, but some sources also said three. So age divided by four plus four is an uncuffed tube and age divided by four plus 3.5 is a cuff tube in pediatric patients. Really important to know that. Last one here, how do you calculate the maximum chest tube size in children? This is going to be four times the endotracheal tube size. So for example, on the exam, if they give you a child and they want you to calculate the ET tube size, you can do age divided by four plus four. That's gonna give you the size for the uncuffed tube. You can then take that number, multiply that by four, and you will get the maximum chest tube size in children. Those are some of the simple calculations that you wanna know for the exam because it'll be really easy to just blaze through that question and move on to the next one. That being said, that is the end of this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you got some high yield information out of this. If you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to drop them below. As always, thank you again and good luck studying.